Section 5 of The Age of Elizabeth by Mandel Creighton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Book 1, Chapter 3, Catholic Reaction in England, 1553-55. to The accession of Mary occurred at a time when Charles V was looking for some means of strengthening himself against France and again making himself supreme in Germany. Mary was his cousin, and had been brought up in traditional reverence of his wisdom and power. During the last reign, Charles had interfered to procure for her the right of celebrating Mass according to the Roman use, which Edward VI was desirous to stop according to the law. Mary, at her accession, found herself without a friend whom she could entirely trust. She was fervently attached to the old religion, and her fondest desire was to restore it to England. She threw herself upon the emperor for support in this, and trusted to his wisdom for her guidance. It is this that gives Mary's reign its interest. If England could only be allied firmly with Spain, and brought back to the old state of things, Charles V's policy might still succeed. The Austro-Spanish power might be established as supreme in Europe. Change would be rolled back, and future reorganization would depend on the emperor's will. The ideas of Charles V were in the main points much the same as those of Henry VIII. He would have no change in doctrine or in church discipline, but he wished to see flagrant abuses reformed and the Pope's power rendered subordinate to his own. We see in Mary and Philip the result of the struggle of the previous generation. They were both one-sided and bigoted, both submitted themselves entirely to the Pope, and by the very severity of their reactionary measures rendered their success impossible. So scrupulous was Mary even about small matters that she put off her coronation till she had received the oil to be used at the ceremony from Granvella, Bishop of Arras. She was afraid that the English oil might have lost its virtue owing to the schism from Rome. The policy which Charles V prescribed was one of moderation and tolerance till she felt secure. Then the alliance with himself was to be secured by Mary's marriage with his son Philip. Afterwards, the restoration of the old state of things might be brought about gradually by legal means. Charles V well knew the temper of the English people, and did not deceive himself about the difficulties of the marriage. He wished Mary, above all things, to secure her throne first of all, and warned her not to imperil it by offending her people. The religious question, however, could not be left unsettled. Mary herself attended the mass service according to the old usage, and in many places the old services were again introduced. The bishops of the Catholic party, who had been deprived of office in the last reign, were restored to their sees, and the reforming bishops were in their turn committed to the tower. Cranmer drew this upon himself by boldly publishing a letter in which he expressed his grief at hearing that the mass service had been restored in Canterbury Cathedral. He denounced its blasphemies, and offered to prove publicly that the Reformed doctrines were in accordance with Scripture. Ridley, Bishop of London, and Latimer, Bishop of Worcester, soon followed Cranmer to the Tower. The Queen's chief adviser was Gardiner, Bishop of Winchester, whom she delivered from the Tower, where he had been confined during the late reign. Gardiner is the last of the great ecclesiastical statesmen in whom medieval England was so rich. He was a statesman rather than an ecclesiastic, and the odium which has been attached to his name as a persecutor did not seem to be fairly his due. Gardiner was a thorough Englishman. He had been one of the foremost in urging the abolition of the Pope's supremacy under Henry VIII. He wished for a national church, but he did not wish in consequence to see any changes in doctrine or in ceremonies. He could not therefore agree with any of the changes in the late reign, and he honestly wished to abolish them. Gardiner, therefore, as Lord Chancellor, directed Mary's policy when she met her Parliament. The Crown interest had no doubt been greatly used to get a Parliament agreeable to the Queen's views, but the heads of the reforming party were scattered. 
all were discredited by the failure of northumberland's plot some were in prison many had fled to the parts of the continent where they might hold their opinions in safety the middle classes of the large towns were on the whole in favour of the late changes but the country people were on the whole of gardiner's opinion they wanted to have the old state of things but to be rid of the pope under these circumstances we cannot feel much surprise that gardiner found the new parliament easy to manage all the enactments affecting queen catherine's divorce were repealed and mary's legitimacy fully established it was determined to go back to henry the eighth's policy the prayer book was abolished and all the changes of the late reign were undone religion was restored to the condition in which it had been left at the death of henry the eighth so far mary had advanced without difficulty the next question to be settled was her marriage with philip so well did charles v know the opposition this plan was likely to meet with that he would not allow it to be complicated with any further question of the pope's supremacy at once on the news of mary's accession cardinal poole was sent as the pope's legate to england but on his way through the netherlands he received orders from the emperor to go no further without his permission there were many in england who wished mary to marry poole for reginald poole's mother the countess of salisbury was a daughter of the duke of clarence edward the fourth's brother and through her poole could claim a royal descent during henry the eighth's reign poole had gone into exile rather than recognize the royal supremacy he incurred henry's anger by writing a most violent book against his divorce in his plots against henry's throne he so far involved his mother and brothers that they died as traitors on the scaffold the candidate however of the english was courtney earl of devon whom mary had released from the tower he was recommended by his youth his noble family and his descent from the old royal house of england through his grandmother who was a daughter of edward the fourth his own misconduct however gave mary a plausible excuse for rejecting his claims she was determined to marry philip and though gardiner at first opposed this most earnestly yet when he saw the queen's mind was thoroughly made up he did his best to protect the interests of england and make the marriage as little disastrous as might be to the nation and the queen the terms which he drew up and which the emperor was obliged to accept gave philip no royal title over england no rights of succession and no legal influence over english affairs still the very mention of this marriage offended the english national feeling and created deep discontent some english nobles put themselves at the head of risings in different counties in favour of the princess elizabeth and courtney who were to be proclaimed king and queen but the conspirators did not lay their plans wisely in devonshire and cornwall sir peter carew discovered himself too soon and was obliged to flee to france at coventry the earl of suffolk lady jane grey's father was equally unsuccessful and was made prisoner at coventry in kent only under sir thomas wyatt was the rebellion formidable but there it threatened to be dangerous to the queen wyatt at the head of fifteen thousand men advanced against london the queen had no troops to meet him and the citizens were wavering in their opinions in this emergency mary displayed her courage she determined to throw herself upon the loyalty of her people and ordering the lord mayor to summon a meeting of the citizens she entered the guild hall and herself addressed them mary was not prepossessing in appearance but at such a moment the black piercing eyes that gleamed from her sallow face and the deep man's voice that jarred upon the ear in ordinary talk lent greater dignity to her look and speech marriage she said was not so dear to her that for it she would sacrifice her people's good unless her marriage was approved by parliament she would never marry wherefore stand fast against these rebels your enemies and mine fear them not for i assure you i fear them nothing at all next morning twenty thousand men had enrolled themselves to guard the city as wyatt advanced his army fell off from him he forced his way into london but found that no one rose to welcome him 
he tried to retire but was taken prisoner february seventh fifteen fifty four after the failure of this rebellion the queen's advisers determined to strengthen her position still more by removing out of the way all who hereafter might raise claims against her lady jane grey and her husband were beheaded elizabeth and courtney were imprisoned and attempts were made to implicate them in wyatt's rising the emperor urged the necessity of putting elizabeth to death but gardiner felt that the queen was not strong enough to proceed to such a measure the people had supported mary both against northumberland and wyatt not because she was popular but because she was their lawful queen elizabeth claimed their support by a similar reason because she was the lawful heir to the throne to lay hands upon her would destroy mary's own position and make her marriage with philip hated amongst all for the present elizabeth must be spared this unsuccessful rising against mary's marriage made all who were disposed toward the queen give their consent at once to a measure about which they had been previously doubtful parliament gave its approval and philip landed in england in july fifteen fifty four philip himself had been brought up entirely in spain and had imbibed the pride and haughtiness of the castilian nobles he was cold and reserved in manner stiff and formal in speech he was not of robust frame and so had no pleasure in outdoor sports or feats of arms when he left spain and joined his father in the netherlands charles v saw with distress that his son did not succeed in pleasing any of the peoples with whom he had to do the italians murmured at his want of vivacity the flemish despised him for his coldness and want of affability to the germans he was entirely hateful in every way it was in vain that charles v had done his utmost to secure to philip the ultimate succession to the empire ferdinand of austria charles v's brother refused to waive his son's claims and the german princes would not give up their right of election charles v was disappointed in his hopes of bequeathing all his dominions to his son but charles v had appreciated his son's faults of manner and philip was straitly charged to spare no pains in conciliating the english charles v had already resigned to him naples and sicily that he might not come to england as a poor landless prince he came too well supplied with spanish gold which was largely distributed amongst the most influential members of parliament and had great weight in bringing about the reconciliation of england with the pope so anxious was philip to be conciliatory that he begged his attendants immediately on landing to conform to english customs and set them an example by drinking a tankard of english ale the chief anxiety of mary and her husband was to bring back england into union with catholic christendom under the headship of the pope it was a difficult matter and had been felt by the emperor to be so he had urged great caution and moderation and had checked mary's impetuosity he had detained pool the papal legate in flanders and would not allow him to proceed till he had obtained from the pope full powers to allow the secularized church property to remain in the hands of its present holders charles v knew well that the english had always borne very grudgingly the claims of the papal supremacy to get them to admit it again when once it had been thrown off would be a very hard task but to get them to admit it and to require of the nobles at the same time to resign the church lands of which they had obtained possession during the late changes would be entirely impossible on the other hand it was hard for the pope to forgive rebellion against him and leave the rebels in possession of all the booty they had gained it was a bad example to the other european churches under the emperor's influence however pope julius the third who was an easy good-natured man with no very high views of his office gave poole permission to waive the question of the restoration of the abbey lands when this point had been gained matters were easier the royal influence was used to the utmost to procure the election of trusty members of parliament and the temper of the new house of commons was first tried by a bill to reverse the attainder of cardinal poole 
this was at once passed and poole returned to england at first only as an english nobleman but he was so well received by the people that he soon ventured to appear with all the pomp of papal legate this too caused no disturbance and when he reached london he was received with the most marked honours by the queen and her husband parliament at once passed a resolution in favour of reunion with the roman church on st andrew's day november thirtieth fifteen fifty four poole gave his solemn absolution to the nation the queen and philip with all the members of both houses of parliament knelt humbly before him as he freed them from the penalties of schism and restored them to the communion of holy church the papal supremacy was at once restored and all acts of parliament which had been passed against it were repealed at the same time the clergy formally resigned their claims to the church lands which had been seized and an act of parliament established the titles of their existing possessors the nobles and great landholders must have been glad enough at this papal restoration it certainly benefited them as it confirmed their claims to the new lands they had got both of the two religious parties were equally pledged not to disturb them in their possessions the catholic reaction had now firmly set in and was in the full tide of popular favour we have to see how in the next four years it was entirely discredited how it failed to win popular sympathy how it was associated with persecutions with national distress and disaster and left behind it a deep-seated hatred of popery which sent england forward in a new career as the chief protestant nation of europe first of all the victorious catholics entered upon a career of persecution which awoke deep disgust in the mind of the people the old laws against the lollards were revived by parliament and the chief men amongst the reformers were put in prison their condemnation and execution soon followed and men were burnt at the stake in different parts of england to produce a widespread feeling of fear hooper ridley latimer and cranmer who had been bishops were all burnt archbishop cranmer had been induced to recant to save his life but his recantation was of no avail and was only meant to add to his humiliation at the last however his courage came back to him and he died nobly lamenting his cowardice and declaring the depth of his real convictions everywhere the people looked upon these executions with horror and disgust while the resolute behaviour of the martyrs won general sympathy it is true that in other countries religious persecution claimed many more victims than in england but in england the victims were chosen deliberately from the most important people the persecution was not founded on popular fanaticism or widespread religious bigotry but was conducted unapproved of by the government alone it was connected also in the minds of the people with spanish interference and with foreign aggression in no other country did persecution make so deep an impression on the mind of the people and the impression is recorded in the title of bloody which has been attached to the unhappy queen in whose name these horrors were done but if the people saw that a recognition of the pope meant persecution at which they shuddered the nobles and gentry soon found also that it might affect them in their most tender points their pockets the papal claims over the confiscated church lands had been given up but the new pope paul the fourth fifteen fifty five was not at once disposed to agree to the promise made by his predecessor the queen's conscience was hurt by the possession of church lands and she determined to give back to the church all the ecclesiastical property in the hands of the crown she busied herself also with the restoration of monasteries the owners of church lands looked upon this with great distrust they began to feel that if the old religion really made head in england they would not long be able to hold their lands as they had done this munificence of mary towards the church of course diminished the royal revenues the debts which had come down from henry the eighth and had been increased under edward the sixth went on growing the coinage had been debased in value and was not restored foreign trade consequently languished the government was so busily engaged in burning heretics that the national defences were neglected the ships were not kept in repair and the fortifications were allowed to fall into ruins 
the english coasts were ravaged by exiles especially from cornwall who had fled after wyatt's failure and now under french protection infested the channel as pirates every one saw that the government of the catholic revival was not likely to restore national prosperity when in addition to all these causes of discontent was added an estrangement between mary and the pope by which the english saw the pope take the side of their enemies we cannot wonder that mary saw all her hopes fade away and that her reign ended in national humiliation and disasters which began to make the name of the papacy hateful to the majority of englishmen for the causes of this we must go back to consider the plans of charles v and see how they had been prospering End of section five